Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me. You are my light and my salvation. You restore me and lead me for your glory. I long to dwell in your house forever. Well, good morning. My name is Mark Kellerman. I'm the residency director here. And it's my honor to guide us through Psalm 64 as we continue our series in John's absence. He's away for some much needed and well-deserved R&R with his family. So I'd encourage you to be praying for him and for them. But if you would, please turn with me to Psalm chapter 64 as we open God's word together. Now, as, you, uh, as you're turning there, whether you're turning on your phone or device or flipping there in your Bible, if you need a Bible, we have them available underneath the seats. Uh, if you need a Bible, like you actually have no Bible, please come talk to us. We would love to give you a Bible. But I want to begin by asking you a question as you find your place. Have you ever experienced fear in an overcoming sort of way, maybe in a way that you would say it was even a bit paralyzing? Maybe there was a doctor's report that you were anticipating and you were afraid. Perhaps it was financial news and there was news that was coming that potentially could be devastating. Maybe you lost touch with a loved one who you were supposed to meet up with, but you haven't heard from in hours and you don't know how to get a hold of them or what has happened. Maybe you've been in actual, literal, physical danger and you know what that is like. Maybe... You've been in law enforcement, military, seen combat. And when fear can get a hold of you, it's like an icy grip that won't let go. I, we're talking this morning about fear. I think it's something we can all relate to. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines fear as an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous. It's likely to cause pain or harm or it is a threat. So fear, sometimes it's hard to distinguish from the threat itself, but it is an emotion. It's a feeling, it's a state of mind, an internal response to a sort of external threat and danger. It's either real or imagined. It's physical or emotional. It's psychological. It can even be spiritual in nature. But fear itself can be quite crippling, can rob you of your peace of mind, can affect the way you sleep, how much you eat or how little. It can affect your relationships with other people. It can affect your relationship with God himself even. So how do you tend to respond when fear takes hold of you? Beyond that, not only how do you respond, how should we respond as Christians? Psalm 64, I think, is a good guide for us in light of these questions. Uh, to begin with, Psalm 64, as it says here in what we call the superscription, this is uh, part of the original text of the Bible. In your, in your Bible, it says chapter 64. Mine says, hide me from the wicked. That's sort of a, a recent title. It's just prompting us to know what's coming. But then in the book of Psalms, there's a lot of a lot of times that this label is here and it says something like this, to the choir master, a Psalm of David. Now that's in the original Hebrew text as old as the rest of the Bible. And what that indicates is two things. One, this is a Psalm of David, either written by him or about him. I think likely it is both. And it's also to the choir master. So this is a prayer of David's which was meant to be sung as a song. So keep that in mind as we read this. David, in Psalm 64, he is faced with fear. He has an enemy. This is a person or perhaps a group of people that are conspiring against him, and it leads him to God in prayer as a response. He prays to God, and what we find, and this is where I get the title of my message this morning, is that we, he moves, we watch David move from fear to faith. And his enemies become, even his fear becomes an opportunity for him 
to experience and know God better. And I think that's the invitation of Psalm 64. This is where we're headed this morning. And I think that the overall effect of Psalm 64 is, is aimed at this. It is meant to encourage and comfort God's people in, who are faced with fear and enemies that are beyond them. But there's another aspect we'll see later on, and that is that this psalm also confronts us. And I want to invite you to join me as we see all of this in Psalm 64. So if you would, in fact, I, want to, I just want to read through the entire chapter. If you would follow along, but I would invite you, if you're able, to please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. And please follow along as I read. Beginning of verse one. Hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Preserve my life from dread of the enemy. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the throng of evildoers who wet their tongues like swords, who aim bitter words like arrows, shooting from ambush, shooting at the blameless, shooting at him suddenly and without fear. They hold fast to their evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly, thinking, who can see them? They search out injustice, saying, we have accomplished a diligent search. For the inward mind and heart of a man are deep. But God shoots his arrow at them. They are wounded suddenly. They are brought to ruin with their own tongues turned against them. All who see them will wag their heads. Then all mankind fears. They tell what God has brought about and ponder what he has done. Let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart exult. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you this morning for the light of your word in Psalm 64 to us. God, I pray that as these words wash over our minds and enter into our hearts, I pray that you would speak them to us by your spirit, that we would be changed by your word, by your presence, by your power, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> so, our first point here, if you're following in the outline, is we move from fear to faith when you realize that God hears you. God hears you. Let me read it again in verse one. Hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Preserve my life from dread of the enemy. So David asks God that he would hear his voice. And specifically, David's voice comes in the form of a complaint. Now, there's nothing wrong with complaining to God. In fact, most of the time we complain to other people. So complaining to God is actually an improvement, you think? Um, and I think uh, what we find here is an invitation from God and his word to pray to God about anything and everything. In fact, that reminds me of Philippians chapter four, verses six to seven which says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, meaning it doesn't depend on your circumstances. It doesn't depend on whether you've got it all figured out or not. It's because God has it all figured out, right? It's because God's circumstance supersedes all of the other ones. And so it's not based on our understanding. Again, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 6 to 7 tells us to humble ourselves before God's mighty hand, casting all our anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for us. So because God is good, and because God is God and because God is there and because he cares for you, then we know that there is a gracious invitation from God to us that we would draw near to him and that we would talk to him about anything and everything, especially 
those things that concern us, even our complaints. So I think the truth is here, this is a, a, a fact and a reality. If you're a believer in Christ, you've been in church for a while, this is not news to you, hopefully. But here's the reality. I believe more times than not, we take this far too casually. We need to be much more amazed by this reality that the most important and the most powerful being in the universe, indeed the most important and the most powerful person in the universe has promised to hear you when you speak to him. And that's something I think we can be more amazed by. Beyond that, I think what's also happening here, so David's complaining in, in perhaps even the current use of that word, but I think there could be like a legal complaint that he's bringing before the judge of all the universe, the only one who is righteous and just, the only place he knows he will actually be heard and actually receive total justice. It's at the throne of God himself. And so he brings his complaint. And this is our first point. We move from fear to faith when we know that God hears you, when you know that God hears you. So our second point about moving from fear to faith is when we understand not only that God hears you, but also that God hides you. Also that God hides you. I wanna read in, again, verse one through verse six, and listen to the nature of David's enemies as he describes them. Hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Preserve my life from dread of the enemy. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked from the throng of evildoers who wet their tongues like swords, who aim bitter words like arrows, shooting from ambush at the blameless, shooting at him suddenly and without fear. They hold fast to their evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly, thinking, who can see them? They search out injustice, saying, we have accomplished a diligent search. I like the New Living Translation, which says, we have devised the perfect plot for the inward mind and heart of a man are deep. Not only does David ask that God would hear him, but he also asks that God would preserve his life. He's actually concerned about his life as these people are collaborating against him. He asks God to hide him from the hidden ambush of these enemies. They were secret, they were devious, crafty, and cunning. And David, you know, may have been a mighty warrior in and of his own right, and he was indeed, but he was no match for an enemy that he could not see. And that's what David has encountered here, and this is why he's praying. In verse two, it says they make secret plots. In verse three, they aimed words like deadly weapons. In verse four, they wore camouflage and planned surprise attacks. In verses five to six, they are laying traps that were hidden and deceptive. And, and the dangers, as, as David is enumerating them, they repeat, they deepen, they amplify and enlarge. And David felt this paralyzing sense of fear. He calls it dread. I have this dread of the enemy in verse one. And he felt needy, exposed, and vulnerable. Therefore, David is crying out to God for protection. Do you know how that feels? Have you ever felt in like, like this in any way for any reason? You know, your enemies might not be quite like David's are exactly, but we all have a deadly enemy. And the Bible is very clear about this. Jesus describes him in John 10:10 10, 10, and says that he comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. And indeed, spiritually speaking, this is the enemy of our soul, Satan himself, and the power of sin and darkness in the world around us. Because you see, Satan hates God. And how does he wage war against him? Well, one of the ways he does is he assaults God's people. He assaults anyone, no matter who they are, in the image of God, because all humanity is born in the image of God, made, even though it's broken, made in the image of God. And Satan attacks mankind. And Satan attacks those that are in Jesus Christ. 
as a way of attacking God. He comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, and he is a mighty foe. In fact, he is beyond us. The, even act, the evil actions of other people, like when you encounter uh, enemies of a variety of kinds in your life, real people, the truth is there's a way that sin and darkness lies behind that. That's actually the ultimate driving force. We read about this in Ephesians 6, verse 12. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I mean, you might say, hold on. No, I actually had a fight with that guy. Okay, so there's actual flesh and blood that's at work. But the reality is the flesh and blood is not the ultimate source. The ultimate source is beyond that. We wrestle not only against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And like it or not, you and I are simply no match for enemies like that. Those that are potent and hidden, and we are no match for them. So how do we respond? According to Psalm 64, we respond by hiding ourselves in God. Let me illustrate this in a way. Um, I don't know how many of you may be hunters or animal lovers. Believe it or not, there's not much difference. Um, <laughs> so, so I think about like deer and elk, like, like these big game animals. Okay, these are very strong, uh, relatively intelligent, uh, very, very fast at times. Uh, highly attuned sense of uh, ability to survive. And, and so what happens when this kind of, these animals can, can avoid all kinds of predators, but what happens when the danger of bullets and arrows begin to fly? Well, they understand enough to put that into action and they go looking for a place to hide. In fact, they like refuges. We call them wildlife refuges. Um, and so you, you think about, I, we, we moved recently from Colorado. We live near the Rocky Mountain National Park, which is a nature preserve of over 400 square miles. It's over 200,000 acres of unhuntable wilderness. And, and especially during hunting season, the elk in particular will gather there by the thousands because they're seeking refuge. They're hiding these are big, strong, capable creatures, and yet they need something larger than themselves to protect them. In fact, you see this picture right here. This is an, a picture I took a few years ago, and you notice that the guy is shooting him with a camera and not a weapon. Like if he was outside the park just a mile or two away, that same guy could be shooting at him, but he knows, and he wouldn't even be there. He would run from people. But in that context... They just walk through the cars and pass the cameraman and because they know that they are safe when they take refuge in that environment. So in the same way, you and I are no match for our many enemies. Like David himself, our own self-reliance, our own natural resources are just simply not enough. And we must take refuge in God and let him hide and protect us like a, like a good father who would shield his children from danger or bullies or whatever. We need to hide in God because we know that he loves and receives us. We move from fear to faith when we believe that God hides us. It's our third point. You move from fear to faith when you see that God defends you. God not only hides you, but he actively defends you. We read about this in verses seven and eight. But God shoots his arrow at them, at these enemies. They are wounded suddenly. They are brought to ruin with their own tongues turned against them. All who see them will wag their heads. Here we encounter one of the most encouraging and reassuring phrases in the whole Bible. Two simple words and I would encourage you to memorize these and base your entire life on them. Grammatically speaking, it's a conjunction and a noun. The words but and God, right? But God, it means except for God. These enemies, these threats are haunting us. They're overcoming us except for 
God. We encountered this phrase a few weeks ago when Aaron Ferguson was preaching on the doctrine of salvation in Ephesians chapter two. It said, you in your natural state were broken, separated from God. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But God, what did God do? God caused you to be born again and he brought you from death to life through Jesus Christ. And so we were dead, but God, we were brought to life. David's enemies were cunning, hidden, dangerous, and scary. But God knows. God is there. God is mighty. God is good. And God defends his people. And here David's fear begins to melt away in Psalm 64 as he contemplates the nature of God himself. You know what happens when we get afraid or terrified by our circumstances or the enemies in our lives? We, we see them, and the truth is, to some extent, we begin to have faith in them. We believe, excuse me, <clears throat> we believe that they're able to bring their threats to pass. But when we follow David here, we begin to see and behold God and exert our faith in God, and we see what God can do and what God has promised and what God is doing then the fear begins to melt away. Verse seven says, but God shoots his arrow at them. Notice he only needs one and they are wounded suddenly. David's enemies would plot, hide, whisper, slander, and lie, shooting at him from ambush, shooting suddenly and without fear, but the Lord has set an ambush for them. The fix is in. They make their threats, but God has a threat of his own, and they don't even see it coming. We read about it in verse 8. They are brought to ruin with their own tongues turned against them. All who see them will wag their heads. It's like a boomerang of justice that brings their evil deeds and plans back upon their own heads, and it brings them to ruin and mockery. Maybe you're familiar with the book of Esther, where uh, Haman, the bad guy of the story, he had built some gallows. He was going to hang Mordecai on it. And what happened at the end of the story? He was the one hung instead. This is a boomerang of God's righteous justice on the wicked. The result is that they are held in contempt. The fear they sought to impose on others comes down upon their own heads in mockery and ruin. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord God Almighty. And you move from fear to faith when you come to see that God is the one who actively defends you. We hear the voice of fear, but God hears our voice in prayer, hearing, hiding, and defending us. And the reality is the results and the effect of this can be quite dramatic. We read about it in the last two verses Verse 9 and 10. Then all mankind fears. They tell what God has brought about and ponder what he has done. The, let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart exult. You can begin to move from fear to faith. We see right here when God delights you. There are two things that are going on here, and let's take them in turn. Verse 9, all mankind fears. Then they tell what God has brought about, and they ponder what he has done. There's two different kinds of fear at work in this passage. One is the crippling kind of fear that an evil adversary or circumstance can bring. And the other is the liberating, healing, life-giving, life-altering fear of the Lord, which Proverbs chapter 9 tells us is the very beginning of wisdom itself. Think about another analogy from the Bible. Think about when Israel was crossing the Red Sea, escaping from slavery in Egypt, and the army of Pharaoh was descending upon them, and God's justice fell upon that army and destroyed them completely. God's people were dramatically saved. Their enemies were destroyed. And what happened? Everyone wrote songs and sang about it. 
More than that, ancient Israel learned that God was truly there. And the surrounding nations that would have been hostile to them, all of them were put on notice. Have you ever experienced anything like that? I certainly don't mean that dramatic, but I mean, have you ever, in either in your own life or perhaps in the lives of people around you, seen and witnessed God work in such dramatic ways that it causes you and other people to think about God and talk about God and begin to revere Him even more? This is the result that we see in Psalm 64. And um, so the invitation is that we would see and that we would behold what God has done and that we would worship him and that we would get to know him better. And this brings us to the Psalms close. Now this is not quite my close yet, but this is the Psalmist's close. So in verse 10, we read again, let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord. And take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart exult. So David concludes with this admonition. Rejoice in the Lord. Take refuge in him. And celebrate like you mean it. That's my definition for exult. So be glad in God. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 says the joy of the Lord. It's God's joy that is your actual strength. So rejoice, be glad in him. Like the deer or the elk being hunted, take refuge in him, hide in God. And then likewise, celebrate like you meant it. Let other people actually see and enter into your joy and put it on display because it brings God glory and it honors him for what he does and it helps other people to see and behold him. Like the old saying goes, The best advertising is done by satisfied customers. But before we conclude, there's sort of a problem. Okay, as I read this and I'm thinking about it, and maybe this has occurred to you as well as you're listening to me, maybe not. But as I, I read through this and sought to even apply it to my own life and I'm praying about these things, I thought, wow, I encounter a word, a couple of words here that, you know, on, at first blush, I don't quite know, to, know what to do with. It says this in verse 10. Let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all who are upright in heart exult. So I have a question for you. Do, are these words, righteous and upright, are these words that always define you? As I read this, I know they don't always define me. And so there's kind of a problem, right? These are promises to righteous, those that are righteous, those that are upright in heart. And uh, so I guess that's kind of my question. Are you you righteous? Are you upright in heart? In fact, as we read the Bible, maybe you've read Romans chapter 3, verse 10. It says there's actually none that are righteous. In fact, he emphasizes it by saying, no, not one. And the claim of anyone to say that I'm upright in heart is a bit scandalous, I think. Um, So let me just say this. You know, I'm not confused about my audience here. Actually, I know for a fact that I'm talking to a room full of people who are broken and sinful and unrighteous. And my fingers are all pointing back my direction too, right? You're looking at an example of one who is unrighteous and not always upright in heart. So I'm talking about us, but I'm specifically talking about you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Some of you have been on the receiving end of something like what David is talking about here. Some of his evil enemies and adversaries, and you can really relate to Psalm 64. And frankly, I hope all of us here, if that's you, it, the reality is this is meant to comfort and encourage you, and I pray that that is the result. But some of you have actually in your life been those enemies to other people. I don't know who you are, and I'm certainly not naming names. Uh, I know I've done this in my life. I have been at times an enemy to other people. You know, there's a way in which all of us, I think, can relate to that. All of us at times are self-serving, and we have uh, self, selfish ambition and selfish gain in mind. We treat people that way. Um, we weaponize our words. 
We spread rumors or lies, we gossip, slander, malign other people. Sometimes, whether we mean to or not, we spoil people's friendships. We interfere with them and their relationship with, even with God. We set traps for them. We're jealous and selfish. And sometimes this happens in our families, right? Maybe at home. Sometimes it happens at at the office, like where you work, people you work with. You've seen it, certainly, but then sometimes you're, you're the cause of it. Perhaps it's at school if you're a student, in the cafeteria, in the classroom, wherever it might play out. I mean, God forbid, I, I would assume it even happens in the church. In fact, I've been pastoring long enough to know that it actually does. So, so I'm not confused about who I'm addressing. I love you all yeah, just as much as I love myself. But these are words where we see what God is doing, I think, in a moment like this, is holding up a mirror for us to see ourselves really clearly because uh, because here the reality is we're not the hero of this story you know even David himself is not the hero of this story David is the one who is in need David was there were times in David's life when he was the enemy right and so he's calling out to God who can save him and have mercy on him and I think either way Psalm 64 provides a bit of a rebuke and a bit of a confrontation to people like us and as we look into the mirror of Psalm 64, we see, we see some of these things. I, what I hear here, and what I want to extend to all of us here this morning, is that here we encounter a gracious invitation from God, that we would return to him in repentance, and that that's what I want to invite you to do this morning. Because what we've learned here in this chapter is that God sees, God hears, God knows. And when you were that enemy, you didn't get away with it. Because God is the one who is the only righteous judge, and he calls every single one of us to an account. You need to make that right with God. Whatever perhaps has come into your heart and mind, whether it's a current reality or a distant memory, You need to make that right with God, and you may need to go and make that right with other people. That's a step we often lack, but that's true repentance, is inconveniencing ourselves to make it right with other people as God makes it right with us. So I would just say, as we're in, as whether you're in the middle of a of a sin and a crime like that, or whether it's just a distant memory or something else, I want you to see and hear and understand that the gospel message from Psalm 64 says that there is a hero to this story. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is the only one who is righteous and upright in heart. And he suffered at the hands of his enemy on our behalf. He was talked about, betrayed, lied about, tortured, and indeed he was ambushed unto the point of death for you and for me. Amen? And so this is what we see here because it's him who saves you. It's him who forgives you. It's him who will rescue you. And it's him who will change you. The Lord takes us where he finds us, which is good news indeed. But he doesn't leave us that way. He loves us too much to leave us the way that we are. And he wants to change us and to do so in a way that brings him honor and glory. So... As we turn to him in faith, as we repent of our sins, and we turn away from those things, we turn in faith to God in trust, and we turn and follow Jesus. So this is where, as we begin to kind of land the plane on this, we're approaching our final point. Um, God is the hero of this story. If you have, or if you will, The invitation is to come to him, to trust in him, to turn from your sin and walk in his forgiveness for you. Come and follow Jesus. God is a gracious and a willing God, and he is willing and ready to receive every one of us. 
So um, if that doesn't excite you, frankly, I don't know what will. I know it's nine or whatever the time is, okay? But this is good news and good news indeed. I just want to read it again because verse 10 reflects a dramatic reality. If this is you, if your righteousness is in Jesus Christ, then this applies to you. Let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart exult in him. And because we move from fear to faith, when we find that God thrills, fills, and changes us, we believe that God delights you is what we see here in this verse. So in the face of enemies, foes, and fears, Psalm 64 assures us that we are heard, hid, defended, and delighted as we take refuge in God. And here we begin to land the plane. This is my conclusion. We move from fear to faith. If you're following in the outline, number five, point number five, is we do so when we believe that it is not about you. It is ultimately all about God. Just listen to the course of this chapter. God hears. God hides. God defends. God delights. And God deserves all of the glory. We just get all the benefits. Verse 9, fear God and tell others what he has done and let it change the way you think and live. Verse 10, rejoice in the Lord and hide in him and then celebrate like you mean it in repentance and faith in a way that others can see and benefit from. Learn to pray from Psalm 64 and look to God in faith as you do. In the end, don't leave here today without letting God confront and comfort you with these words. We hear God's we, sorry, we hear the voice of fear, but God hears our voice in prayer, and we move from faith, sorry, from fear to faith when we take refuge in Him.